Welcome everyone uh, to the second night of the Notre Dame Vita Institute 2020 webinar. I'm Carter Sneed. I'm the director of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture here at the University of Notre Dame, where I'm also a professor of law and a concurrent professor of political science. The mission of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture is to share the richness of the moral and intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church through teaching, research, and public engagement both on campus at Notre Dame and as Notre Dame in the global public square. The Vita Institute is the flagship offering of, all, of our Culture of Life programming, and we're delighted to have you join us for this week's presentations. The webinar series will provide you with a small taste of our week-long Vita Institute intellectual formation program that each summer since 2010 has brought pro-life leaders from around the world to campus here at Notre Dame to study the fundamental of the life issues with world-renowned scholars across a wide range of disciplines, including social science, biology, philosophy, law, theology, communications, and counseling. We now have over 350 Vita Institute alumni around the world, including the senior leaders of the most high profile and important pro-life organizations on every continent, except Antarctica, as well as physicians, researchers, counselors, and concerned citizens from across the full spectrum of pro-life vocations, who have joined us on campus to further enhance their expertise and to prepare them to be even more effective in their work. We also have 600 alumni from our satellite Vita Institute programs held in New York, Los Angeles, and Houston. And we're proud that 70% of our Vita Institute alumni are women. Our full Vita Institute program includes more than 20 presentations covering the full spectrum of topics uh, essential to building a culture of life, including such important issues as racial inequality, disability, adoption, euthanasia and assisted suicide, public health policy, integral human development, and many more issues. In this week's condensed series of presentations, we're highlighting issues surrounding the beginning of life. And later in the week, we will widen our conversation to address the equal human dignity that we all share. In addition to this week's series, we're preparing a panel discussion to explore how the core principles and goods at the heart of the culture of life movement, namely unconditional love, radical hospitality, solidarity, and the respect for the intrinsic equality of every human being, how these principles, we're gonna explore how these principles are generative of a commitment to fight unjust racial discrimination and to accompany our brothers and sisters of color in their continuing struggle for genuine equality. We'll share details and registration information about that future panel in upcoming weeks. For the more than 500 of you who joined us last evening for Frank Beth Beckwith's opening session on the philosophical arguments surrounding abortion, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time this evening, you're in for su a superb presentation. A bit about the format of this evening's webinar. Our speaker, who is currently located on the other side of the globe in the Philippines, pre-recorded his talk to ensure the best possible quality and internet connection. We will watch his presentation together and then afterwards, he'll join us for the live Q&A. During the talk, those of you who are logged into the Zoom webinar are welcome to pose your questions in the chat box, and we will select representative questions for him to answer. Tonight's presenter is a good friend of the Vita Institute and a great friend of mine, Dominican father, Nick Ostriaco. The Reverend Nicanor Pierre Giorgio Ostriaco currently serves as professor of biology and of theology at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. He's also a research fellow at the University of Santo Tomas in Manila, Philippines, and founding director of ThomisticEvolution.org. His NIH-funded laboratory at Providence College uses yeast as a model organism to interrogate human disease. Father Ostriaco is a bioethics consultant for the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the United States and of the Philippines. Father Ostriaco completed his Bachelor of Science degree in bioengineering, summa cum laude, at the University of Pennsylvania, and then earned his PhD in biology from MIT. He completed his pontifical license in sacred theology at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, DC, and a pontifical doctorate in sacred theology at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. He earned his MBA from Providence College in 2020. Father Ostriaco has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers in biology, philosophy, and theology, and two books, including Biomedicine and Beatitude, An Introduction to Catholic Bioethics, which was recognized as 2012 Choice Outstanding Academic Title by the Association of College and Research Libraries. A second edition of the best-selling book 
is forthcoming in 2021. And now we're delighted to present Father Nick Ostriaco speaking on when does life begin the scientific evidence. Welcome, Father Nick. Good evening. My name is Father Nick Ostriaco, and I would like to begin by thanking the Vita Institute for their kind invitation to participate in this COVID-19 webinar series. This evening, I would like to review the scientific evidence that we have in support of the pro-life claim that human life begins at conception. But before we do that, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, creator of all things, so true source of light and wisdom, Graciously let a ray of your light penetrate the darkness of my understanding. Give me a keen intellect, a retentive memory, and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Give me the talent of being exact in my explanations and the ability to express myself with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and perfect my work. We ask you this, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So this evening, my lecture is going to be divided into three sections. We're going to begin with a conversation, a discussion about organisms. And I begin this way because I want to clarify and make sure that we really understand what we're talking about when we talk about the beginnings of human life. Once we've clarified the meaning of an organism, we're gonna to move to origins. We're gonna be discussing the second section, the scientific evidence that suggests that organisms have their origins at conception. And then finally, the third part of my presentation this evening will focus on three objections that pro-lifers usually receive when they make the claim that human life begins at conception. So we're gonna start with organisms. And in order for me to do this, I'd like to dissect this sentence. When does human life begin? So this is, this, this is the question that pretty much defines the abortion debate in the United States. It has for many years. But I would like to suggest that this question is actually somewhat ambiguous. What does it mean? And I'm going to illustrate that by, by asking a much more specific question, what is human life? So here you have an image of human cells and these cells are alive. Are they human life? They certainly are. But when we're talking about abortion, we're not talking about the origins of these particular cells. This is a human kidney. It too is alive. Is it human life? Well, I think in some sense it is. It is human and it's alive. But this is certainly not worth what we're talking about when we're talking about abortion and fertilization and how fertilization is the, the beginning of human life. So I, I think it, it, it's better to begin with an alternative question. And the question that I would like to focus in on is this, when did you begin? And I would like to talk about you. What are you? Now, when I ask this question, a lot of people will say, well, I'm a human being. But again, being is not precise. We're not quite exactly sure what a human being is. And so I'm going to propose to you this evening that it is better to ask about the human organism because you are a human organism. And so I'm gonna just begin with, with, with a definition of an organism. It's an individual of a biological species which undergoes a species defined biological life cycle. And I need to spend a couple of minutes to parse this all out. So this is an image of model organisms. A model organism is an organism that is used by biologists in the lab in order to study different forms of life. And so you have on the lower left, you have the model organism that a lot of us is, are familiar with. That's the mouse. The, on the lower right, you actually have the model plant organism, which is an Arabidopsis plant, very similar to mustard. Uh, 
And um, the other organisms indicated here. So you've got Xenopus slavis, that's the African clawed frog. You have Drosophila, which is the model fly. And then you have Cenorabiditis, which is the model worm. And each one of these organisms is being studied in the laboratory somewhere in the world. And each one is being used to understand different aspects of biology. And so this is what an organism is. It's an individual of a particular species. And I think it's really important to highlight that organisms go through life cycles. So here you've got the life cycle of Drosophila, which is the fruit fly that a lot of biologists study in the laboratory. On the very top of the image, you've got a male and a female fly. And after fertilization, they, they generate an embryo, which takes a few days to go through a life cycle to produce a pupa out of which will develop the mature fly, the adult fly that you and I are most familiar with. Now, it's interesting to point out that the organism, the actual individual organism, which begins with an embryo when the egg and the sperm of the adult flies meet up, actually goes through different distinct stages. So, it, so for example, after one day, the embryo becomes a first instar larva, and the larva is really just a small caterpillar. And that larva continues to eat for several days. And during those several days, as it increases its size, it goes through different morphological changes. It changes its shape, it changes the way it looks, and in some cases, it actually changes the way it behaves. And so you've got a second instar larva, a third instar larva, and then it actually pupates, out of which you have the adult fly. And the organism goes through each one of these stages, but it's the same organism. You can see the same thing with the Xenopus life cycle, the African clawed, flock, clawed frog. You begin with a fertilized egg and within a few hours, that egg will become a tadpole, which then goes ahead and spends 12 months maturing until it develops into an adult. And you can see there's a difference in size between the male and female African clawed frogs where the females are much larger than the males. But again, each one of these adult frogs went through these individual stages because each one of the stages is a characterize, is, characterizes the, the life cycle of this particular organism. Now on the left side of my slides, you might have noticed that there's an image uh, that many of you may not be familiar with. So if you look at the, the image on the left, you actually have the image of my second favorite organism. I'm a yeast molecular biologist. That's what I do. I use yeast cells in order to interrogate the genetics of cancer and now Parkinson's disease. And even these single cells, these are single celled organisms actually have a life cycle. And so I just wanted for, for the sake of interest, I wanted to, to highlight the life cycle of budding yeast that my students and I at Providence College spend a lot of time studying. Now here is the life cycle of the organism that you and I are most familiar with. This of course is the organism Homo sapiens, the species to which we belong. Again, just like the flies and the, and the frogs, there are male and female organ versions of our species and that produce eggs and sperm. And when these meet up at fertilization, you now have the appearance of the organism itself. And we'll be spending the second part of the lecture really focusing in on how we know an organism begins at fertilization. So you then are a human organism. And so if you ever want, if someone ever asks you, you know, what exactly are you, then the, the most precise biological answer is that you are a human organism, an individual that is going through the life cycle of Homo sapiens. And I thought that it would be interesting to just 
cite this verse from sacred scripture. This is from Psalms. It talks about our life cycle. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. And so this again, um, in one snapshot is the richness and beauty of the, of the life cycle of the human being. And we would say um, the only organism made in the image and likeness of God. So now what I'd like to do is move on to the second part of my lecture this evening to discuss the origins of organism. And so the question here is, when does the human organism begin? And in order for me to address and respond to this question, I'd like to ask you what is hopefully a, a non-controversial question. This is a picture of Siamese twins. These are conjoined Siamese twins. If I asked you how many organisms are shown here, I hope most of you would agree that there are two. Even though they're physically attached to each other, there are actually two organisms. And one of the ways that we know this is that we can identify their body axes. So the body axes specify the organism. And so you have an axis, you've got the top, the bottom, the left, the right, the front and the back. And so each of these organ, you and I as human organisms are specified by three sets of axes and different organisms up and down the hierarchy of life either have one, two or three body axes. And what's really important is that you understand that body axes reveal the organization of the organism. And I hope you can see that there's a relationship between the word organism and organization. We are organisms because we are organized forms of living matter. So the reason why it is appropriate and correct and true to talk about two organisms in this image of conjoined twins is really because we can identify two sets of body axes here. Now, when I present this to my students at Providence College, many of them will raise the different scenarios of conjoined twins where you might have simply one body and two heads, for example. Th those are much more complex scenarios and we would have to go in there to try to identify which of those cells belongs to which organism, but that, but that discussion is beyond the scope of my lecture this evening. What this means then is that when we ask the question, when does human life begin? Or more properly, when does the human organism begin? We can reduce that to a very simple biological question. When do the human body axes first appear? So when does it, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to refer to a paper that was published out at the University of Cambridge, oh, nearly 20 years ago now. And this paper was very striking because their experiments suggested that the body axes, the patterning of the early mouse embryo, and the reason why we study mice is because mouse embryonic development is uh, the close, it's the model organism that best mimics human organ, human developmental biology. And, and I should actually point out that these results have been corroborated with some experiments that have been done with macaques, which are monkeys, primates, which are more similar to us. And so you can imagine the, the, the human egg is a sphere. And so the sphere doesn't really have a top or a bottom, a left or right a front or a back. But what happens in this paper from Magdalena Zernica Goetz's lab at the University of Cambridge demonstrated is that the one, the one celled zygote, and so that's the fertilized egg, that is the earliest form of the organism, is an organism precisely because the single sperm, the, the sperm entry point, often called the SEP, is instrumental in determining the first patterns, the first organization, the first sign of a body axis in the mammalian embryo. And so in the image on the left, 
You've got on the very top what you have polar body. We don't need to go into what that is at the moment. But once you have that sperm penetrating the sphere of the egg, you therefore specify the plane, the first axis, the, the plane through which that one celled embryo will now split and become two cells. And so what you have here is the first appearance of a top and a bottom. And so you have the first ex uh, appearance of body axes and therefore the first sign of organization for the mammalian organism. And such, when, so when we, we talk about when does the human organism begin, I would like to show uh, what, this, what, this, what this paper shows is that it actually happens, the, the, the human organism first appears, the human organism begins, human life begins at fertilization because the sperm entry point specifies the human body axes for the first time. Now, to conclude this lecture, I'd like to deal with three objections that often come up when I discuss this with my students. The first objection deals with twinning. So a lot of people will, 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 will object and they'll say, look, twinning shows that the embryo is not an organism. Now, earlier this week, I actually Googled identical twins and it turns out that this is a picture of the quote, most identical, identical twins. And um, so, they are very difficult to distinguish one from the other because they are genetically identical for the most part. And because of that genetic identity, they physiologically, they look very, very similar. And um, there are testimonies online that suggest that it's very difficult for people, even people who know them very well, to distinguish these two individuals. Now, the biology of monozygotic twinning is that a single fertilized egg, a single embryo, sometime early in human development, we're talking here probably within the first five days, and this, used, this probably occurs during fertilization, uh, during the first five days that the embryo spends in his mother's fallopian tube, divides into two, the single zygote divides into two, giving rise to two distinct individual organisms, two distinct embryos that develop side by side in their mother's uterus. Now the objection to the pro-life claim that the human organism begins at fertilization usually goes as follows. If I divide you, clearly you are an, or are an organism. If I divide you into two, both parts of you will die. So, and yet, if I divide a human embryo into two, both parts will survive. Therefore, this suggests, this is the, this is the logic of the argument, that a human embryo is not a human organism because human organisms cannot be split in such a way that both parts would survive. Now, in response to that, I think the best way to counter that objection is to, to point out that some organisms, in fact, can twin. So this is a, a planaria. This is a flatworm. This is the classic example from high school. and We actually even teach it in college. The planaria is an organism that can twin. If you, tw if you split the planaria down the middle, either way, from top to bottom, left or right, uh, those individual parts are able to regenerate into identical holes. And so the planaria is an organism that can regenerate. And so all we have to say to counter that, that objection is the following. The human organism is in fact an organism and we know we're, we're making this claim precisely because of the appearance of the body axes during fertilization. But to account for twinning, we have to then make this spectacular claim. And I think this claim makes sense 
uh, the human organism can regenerate early in its life cycle. And so that means you could regenerate once. You could regenerate the first five days or so. If I split you into two, each of those parts would have regenerated into a complete organism. Now, it's striking that there are a lot of scientists today who are working with planarium, with flatworms, trying to understand the secrets behind regeneration. And the claim is the following. If we could regenerate early in our life cycle, why can't we regenerate today? That's the very first question, the biological question. The second question is this. Is there a way that we could tweak using drugs? Could we tweak the adult organism so that the adult organism could regenerate? And we're, a lot of people are looking primarily into regeneration of the spinal cord in order to potentially provide cures or healing for individuals who've undergone uh, traumatic spinal injuries and who are not therefore paralyzed. So that's objection number one. Objection number two deals with embryo loss. And this is based on the following observation. There, there's an observation that 13 to 25% of pregnancies detected by an HGC, HCHCG is a human hormone that is secreted early in pregnancy. And so the idea here is that 13 to 25% of pregnancies that are detected by the presence of HCG in the woman's body do not progress to live birth. And um, I just wanted to point out that HCG, human gonadotrophic hormone, actually appears very early on. Um, in fact, it, it appears pretty much even several days before the expected period. So you, you, you can, you, eight days before a woman expects her period, she can already detect HCG using, um, using the basic pregnancy test. And the, the argument, the objection that is made is that since many human embryos do not survive to live birth, then human life cannot begin at fertilization because this would be too wasteful. And this is a simplification of an argument that uses this observation to undermine the claim that human embryos must have equivalent moral status to human adults because too many human embryos are lost. And in response to that, we have to ask this question, what exactly is lost in an early miscarriage? So let me begin by reviewing early human development. So this is the earliest stages of the human life cycle. So you have an image there of the egg that is ovulated from the woman's ovary, it enters her fallopian tube. Fertilization occurs in the fallopian tube if sperm are also present. And it takes about five days for the developing organism, the human organism, at this point an embryo, to migrate down into his mother's uterus. Now these five days involve very particular and specific changes in the shape and the form of the human organism. So a single cell will eventually divide into a four cell embryo, into a multiple cell embryo, and eventually into a blastula, which is an embryo with a fluid filled cavity. So the question is the following. When we detect human gonadotrophic hormone, what exactly are we detecting? And are we in fact losing true embryos? And I think it's important to note that with artificial reproductive technologies, it's become clear that 15% to 25% of eggs fertilized by sperm actually do not develop. They do not progress through the human life cycle. And because of this, properly speaking, they're not organisms, they're not embryos. So I think what, one of the ways that we can respond to objection two 
the apparent loss of many fertilized eggs is that it is not embryo loss, it is actually egg loss. So you have dud eggs, and these dud eggs, when fertilized, actually do not become embryos precisely because of a genetic malfunction, a defect of one reason or the other in the egg. And so when we're talking about the less than expected number of pregnancies, one possible explanation, and there are at least one of the reasons we can provide for this apparent high number of absent pregnancies is that human eggs are, a significant number of human eggs are actually dud eggs. So the final objection that I'm going to deal with this evening has to deal with personhood. And this is actually primarily a philosophical argument rather than a scientific one, but it has a lot of, bear, uh, uh, this question really is really important to appreciate because a lot of people often will use personhood as a way to attack or undermine the claim that the, that you began at fertilization. So the argument usually goes this way. Human embryos may be human organisms, and that's what we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes or so, but they are not human persons. And the further claim is that since only human persons have a right to life, human embryos do not have that right to life. And so in order to evaluate this question, we need to talk about a person. What is a person? And this is, this is a very controversial and convoluted historical question, actually. But in the Western tradition, for the most part, there is a consensus that a person is a being who is able to know and to will. For humans, we could talk about a person as being an organism who's able to know and to will. But in this particular case, we're going to use the word being rather than organism because as Christians, we actually acknowledge the existence of spiritual beings, angels and demons, um, spiritual beings who are not organisms per se. And then of course you have the ultimate persons, the, the triune persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who in a deep, mysterious way are three persons in one God. So a human organism, and we're just going to take this definition, the human organism is a human person because he or she is a kind of being that is capable of knowing and willing. And I'm going to focus in on this very specific formulation of this definition. The person is a kind of being that has a capacity that is capable of knowing and willing. And, and the reason why I'm going to do this is because it's really important that we talk about the capacity for knowing and willing rather than the ability to know and to will right now. So in order to flush this out, to flush this out, I'm going to, I would like you to ask to consider this question. Are human organisms mammals? And for some of you, biology, it's been a while since you've had biology. So I'm gonna review a slide, an image that I downloaded from the internet. And these are the characteristics of mammals. They must breathe air, they're warm blooded, they have hair or fur, they're vertebrates. They, have, they give birth to live babies. They take care of their babies and they nourish their babies with milk. So these are the seven characteristics for the most part of a mammal. Now here's a question that you may never have considered. Is a man a mammal? So this is an image of a Filipino couple. On the left-hand side, you've got a male, where a, a, a Filipino male, and on the right-hand side, you've got a Filipino female. And the question is, is a man a mammal? Now, uh, hopefully you and I will agree that men are mammals just as much as females are mammals. But notice, males are mammals even if they themselves will never be able to bear live young or to lactate. So men 
are incapable of giving birth to live young. And for the most part, they're unable to lactate. And the reason why we say they're mammals is because we are affirming that they are a kind of animal, an animal with a nature that has these capacities. So even though males will never be able to bear live young, or they can never lactate, they will never lactate, they have a nature, human nature, that has these capacities. And so what we're basically claiming is the following, that all human organisms are mammals, regardless of whether or not they can lactate or bear live young at a particular moment in time. And so in the same way that all human organisms, males and females are mammals, we are claiming that all human organisms, whether or not they're embryos, fetuses, babies, toddlers, kids, teenagers, young adults or mature adults, these are all different human organisms at different places in their life cycle. We claim that all of them are persons, regardless of whether or not they can think or choose at a particular moment in time. Now, when I brought this up in class, I've had students who will say, well, I'm just going to object to that claim. I'm just going to say that to be a person, a human organism must be able to think and to choose right now. And since a human embryo or a human fetus, um, especially early in human development, cannot think or choose right now, it is not a person. And so I, I know a lot of my colleagues and friends who are actually abortion advocates have this view. They, they need to have the human organism think and choose right now. But, but here, here's, here's the question, right? What about a patient in a coma with severe brain damage? Now, this person cannot think, he cannot choose right now. Is he a person? Is he not a person? And of course, we're going to say that he is a person. So we say that basically a coma patient is a person because he can heal so that he will be able to know and to will. And in the same way, we're going to make the claim that a human embryo is a person because he can develop so that he will be able to know and to will. And the underlying reality behind, at the, behind this is that both the coma patient and the human embryo both have a human nature that has the capacity that in its very itself has the capacity to know and to will that has to that can be actualized either by healing or by developing. And so those are the three objections that a lot of my students raise. There are many, many more, but I thought I'd focus on these three. These three common objections to the claim that human life begins at fertilization. So in conclusion this evening, um, in terms of take home lessons, uh, I would like to point out that the very best scientific and philosophical, the very best scientific and philosophical reasoning reveals that human life begins at fertilization. And there are many, many other things that I didn't bring up um, that I guess I could add on just at the moment. I am taking for granted that at fertilization, you have a new genetic organism. So the coming together of sperm and egg is such that this is an organism, a human organism that has never existed before and will never exist again, other than twinning, of course. And so at fertilization, we have a human organism that has a nature that allows him to know and to will. And this is a nature that reveals itself through development in the same way that it can reveal itself after injury through, after, through a process of healing. And, the, and therefore, properly speaking, the human embryo is a person, is there, he's already a person. This is why we, it is proper to use the, pr the personal pronouns rather than the impersonal pronouns to describe the human embryo. And that he is already a person who has a right to life. Thank you very much.
Okay, that was wonderful. Thank you, Father Nick. Now we are joined live and in person with Father Nick, not the uh, recorded version. It's always better to have the live version of Father Nick than a recorded version. Uh, thank you, Father Nick, for joining us all the way across the world from the Philippines. I ha We've been, throughout your terrific lecture, we've been assembling questions from the audience members, and many of the questions were sim thematically similar. And so what we did is we took some of these questions and we put them together. And uh, I'll just serve as a moderator and ask you the questions and you can take off from there. We've got um, ample time to have a conversation and questions. So uh, the first question I have um, relates to the language of potentiality and actuality. In Roe v. Wade and in the subsequent cases that I'll be discussing tomorrow, the Supreme Court purports not to pass on the moral or ontological question of when life begins, but then they use the phrase potential life throughout the opinion. Uh, could you say a little bit about why, in light of your presentation this evening as a, bio a matter of biological categories, biological. to refer to the unborn child as potential life is not accurate? Well, I, well, first of all, can you hear me? I'm just yeah. checking my connection from the Philippines. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, a couple of things there. I think the first thing I'd point out is that um, at every stage, at every stage of human development, we are in potential for something else. So a teenager is potential life for an adult, if you understand it in the way that the uh, Supreme Court seems to indicate. What it's saying is that it's a potential adult, but so is a teenager and so is a newborn. They're all potential adults. It's really striking that I think that there is an adult-centric view of what constitutes the human person and anything short of that is somehow less than that. So I, I'd like to point that out. I think that the way that it's usually conceived of is it's a potential adult. That's the first thing. But with regards to an organism, I hope that the, one of the take home messages of the video that I recorded is that it is already a, an organism at the very get-go. So it's not a potential organism. It's an organism that will that is potentially an adult organism. It's an organism that is potentially a teenage organism, but it's already an organism that, that, at that time. And that, that, that leads into a different question, which is some folks argue when they're talking about embryo research or if they're even talking about abortion, they they, they ask, they, they look at the question of this potential, being a potential adult, being a potential newborn, being a potential child, as you just sketched out. And they make the argument that, uh, well, if there's going to be some intentional intervention, throwing the embryo out before it's transferred to it, her mother's womb, or uh, performing an abortion before the baby is born, then that, that disrupts the potentiality, and therefore it's not right to think about that child in utero who is destined to die, either because someone's going to intervene or maybe because the, the, the child has a disability or the child has some kind of a, some kind of a condition that means it, that leads to the conclusion the child's going to die in utero or shortly after birth, that that disrupts in some way the, the, our understanding of what the organism is. Could you speak to that, please? Yeah. So uh, several years ago, before I was assigned to Providence College, I served as a hospital chaplain in New York City. And so I had to deal with, at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, I, I had to accompany a lot of little kids who were dying from cancer. And cancer abruptly, well, it, it prevents them from, from achieving their potential adulthood, right? And yet we don't think that, that it would be proper for us to go in there and uh, shorten their life intentionally. And I think the concern, if you take that example and you shift it, say eight years to where the organism was in utero versus ex utero, um, even if the if, even if the fetal child is sick and, or dying, uh, we don't think that it is morally proper for us to intentionally choose to shorten that fetal child. Well, we we don't think it. It's, we should not, we should not, we should not be able to intentionally shorten the life of a human organism, regardless of its developmental stage, whether it's a teenager, an infant, or a fetus. And that's really the, the heart of the argument that the pro-life movement has been making now for several decades. Um, 
a related question is some make the argument, although uh, the empirical basis of this argument has been challenged recently, that, uh, and you discussed this in your remarks, and maybe we can just make it sharpen, sharpen the, the answer to a short answer. Um, there is in natural reproduction, perhaps we believe a high rate of embryo loss, um, uh, failure to implant, uh, perhaps even counting miscarriages, if you count miscarriages, the loss of a, of a, of a, of a child in utero that is past implantation. Some try to point to this reality of natural embryo loss, if in fact it is uh, a reality, as grounds to diminish the moral standing or even the ontological standing of the child in utero. Could you could you respond to that? Well, I mean, I, so again, I, I think that there, I'm going to respond in two ways. The first is those numbers have been challenged. Uh, it's not clear if the high level high numbers of of early pregnancy loss and miscarriages as high as people uh, claim it is. Uh, second, um, as I pointed out in my lecture, it's really hard to identify what is lost because it appears that the human reproductive process is not as efficient as people usually think it to be. But I think it's also important to, to remind ourselves that until recently, the rate of infant mortality was incredibly high. So St. Catherine of Siena was number 25. She was the 25th kid of her mother. Most of her siblings died early on. We would not say that the high infant mortality rate decreases the moral status of newborns. And so if we wanted if we wanted to be consistent, and we're always trying to be consistent, we should be because we're trying to be reasonable individuals, then if we believe that the high rate of early pregnancy loss, which I, I, as you pointed out, is already disputed, if we use that datum and we say that that datum points to somehow uh, a, a denigration of the moral status of the fetus or the embryo, then it's not clear to me why we would not take that same argument and move it a little bit further back in time and a little bit forward in development and say that the high infant mortality rate for most of human history does not in any way decrease the moral status of the newborns that we cherish and we love and we protect sometimes with our lives. Um, could you say something uh, about, uh, so, so a, a lot of folks, a lot of pro-life folks listen to the talk and especially the questions about and the, and the, the life of the new distinct self-directing organism beginning at fertilization, as you say. And a lot of these folks have suffered um, miscarriages uh, in their own lives. How do, how do we, as a pastoral matter, how do you, how do you um, speak to folks who have suffered through those tragedies in a way that, that recognizes their pain and, and, uh, and loss? And the, the flip side of that is, I mean, frequently you'll hear arguments. And when I was the, working for the President's Council on Bioethics, we would hear arguments like, oh, well, the, the human reaction to miscarriages tells us something important about the moral status of the unborn child because we don't care about miscarriages the same way we do about infants dying. And that's... That's, that's probably not a true sociological statement. I mean, I think it understates the pain and loss that people experience when they have miscarriages. So could you say something in your capacity as a, as a priest, how you approach counseling folks who have suffered that kind of a loss? So um, when I have spoken to, when I've spoken to couples who have suffered either miscarriage or stillbirth, which are very similar, um, you know, I have to address a couple of questions. So often parents will ask me whether it was their fault. So they're struggling with guilt. They're wondering as Job uh, wondered whether or not they were being punished in some way by God. And um, you know, one of the things that Jesus points out very clearly is that when you know to the blind man and to his parents who were wondering whether or not they were themselves to blame he says no you know th their child was was blind uh in order to reveal god's power 
And so I, 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 when they ask me why did it happen, I basically I say, I'm not sure and I don't know, but we have the reassurance that I hope that you will be able one day to understand why this tragedy happened, right? So that, so first thing. Second thing I say, look, it's not your fault. There is nothing that you did that in some way led to the death of your child. So, and, and the third thing they usually ask is, you know, where is my kid? And this, the answer, and I will say is, you know, we leave that question in the hands of a merciful father. And, and I think that's really, really important. Um, when I work with post, women who are struggling with post-abortion regret, so I'm a Project Rachel Priest, I get that question a lot as well. And I point these women to the to chapter, to paragraph 99 of Pope John Paul's amazing encyclical, encyclical on the gospel of life, Evangelium Vitae. I think that paragraph 99 is the most important paragraph of the entire text, because in that in that paragraph, the Holy Father, now a great saint of God, specifically uh, speaks to women who have had abortions, who are trying to figure out what happened and what they are called to do. And, and you know, he says, look, um, we know how difficult the abortion decision is. And I think that, and that's one thing that the Project Rachel apostolate has told me is that we, we sometimes in the pro-life movement underestimate the grave burden and the grave suffering that can lead to an abortion decision. And the Pope points out that we do not understand the difficulties and burdens, but we can affirm one objectively that uh, terminating the intentionally terminating the life of an innocent human organism is intrinsically evil. And yet we can acknowledge that individuals who are faced with the grave burden and the challenges that led them to that terrible decision are, not, are often not as morally culpable as we sometimes make them to be because the decisions were not done with the proper reflection that should have been taken. And so he refers them to the mercy of God. And he says, look, God is our father first and foremost, and that we are asked to remind women who've had abortions that mercy is always an option. You know, one of the things I've discovered about uh, working with women, accompanying women who've, who struggle with abortion regret is that they're often, they're, they're, they beat themselves up the most. So to, 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 to women and men who struggle with miscarriage, I would say, you know, God is merciful. God loves you. God loves your child and you will meet your child again. To women who've had abortions, I would say the same thing. I would say, uh, no matter how grave the circumstances were that, that led you to make this uh, tragic decision, the mercy of God remains always at hand. All you have to do is to turn around and look at him. Thank you, thank you for that that answer. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, some of the questioners wanted to know, uh, in your account of the identity of the, of the living human organism at the embryonic stage of development, how do we draw distinctions between the embryo, the living human embryo, and artifacts or biological realities like parthenotes and hydatidiform moles? Maybe you could say what a parthenote is, what a hydatidiform mole is, and how you draw that kind of ontological distinction that you, that you made. So 
One of the things that I try to avoid in my lecture was to go into the nitty gritty right. science right. that often throws people off because they're not quite sure uh, all the details about genetics and fertilization right. and such. But I think what the thing that I wanted to emphasize, and you use this term, is that an organism is an end directed process it's moving towards something and that's how i refer to the life cycle right so a baby a fetus is developing into a newborn which is developing into uh, a teenager which is developing into an adult so there's an it, there is a movement an, a movement which can be traced to its nature that allows it to move forward in a particular way. And this particular way is defined by the species, which is shaped by the genes. And so one of the things that many of us who are thinking about this, when we think about the earliest stages of embryos and we think about artifacts that have been created is we ask whether or not those artifacts, whether there are parthenotes, whether there are hyatidiform for moles, either complete moles or partial moles. These are all different variants of entities that can come about at the beginning of life. We ask whether or not those entities are going through the same stages that a human embryo is known to go through, right? So a baby does not develop into a puppy. And so if it did, we would wonder whether or not that wasn't actually a baby. And so in the same way, uh, philosophers and, and ethicists who are looking at this question are asking the question, if you have a particular entity, if you have a particular artifact, what can we say about how it progresses along human development? If it is not able to progress through human development, then by definition, it is not a human organism because a human organism, organism is an individual that makes its way through those stages of human development. Let me just ask for a brief clarification. When you say if it can't make its way, you mean in virtue of its nature, not in virtue of some disability that's either imposed Absolutely. on it or some, some disability that it might have. Uh, so well, if, again, again, there, you know, there are so many nuances associated with this because biotechnology has allowed people to make all sorts of genetic interventions into embryo-like entities. So, so we would have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. But the overarching criterion is basically whether or not this thing we are looking at is making its way, it's on its own, is it naturally progressing through the stages of human development that we would expect of a human embryo. Right. And just to be clear, since the topic that we're covering this week primarily is the question of abortion, a lot of this conversation that we're having really relates to pre-implantation stages or just immediately. We're not, I mean, if, if, you have, if a woman is far enough along in her pregnancy to be considering an abortion, what we're talking about is a more mature organism to which these kinds oh, of puzzles does, don't really apply. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. At that point, you know, you have formation of the organs, your formation of the body shape that is distinctively human. Most people who, who would look at the fetus on an ultrasound would have no doubt that, that is a human organism that is immature, but a human organism nonetheless. Now, you, again, you talked about this uh, gr great, uh, at great length in your remarks, and just I'm asking just for a summary, a summary point here. Again, one of the common arguments you hear about the biological identity or the ontological identity of the unborn, and again, I'm talking primarily about the embryonic stage of development, is that the capacity, and you talked about twinning in your remarks, but what is, what is the one or two sentence response to the claim that if the organism is capable of twinning, if it's capable of splitting into more than one organism, then it's not a stable individual and we shouldn't think of it as an organism. What, what's the short response to that? We have examples of organisms that can twin it and given the evidence that the org human organism is determined at fertilization, the, the clearest way to interpret what we can see is that the human organism is, has a, the ability to regenerate early in development in a way that you and I do not. 
Yeah. At one, there was a, there's a, um, a scientist, a philosopher from Harvard who put it in a pretty pithy way, even though he himself is in support of embryo research. He said that uh, uh, individuation is not necessary, not necessary. Indivisibility is not necessary for individuation. The fact that you can disrupt the, the developmental plan and the parts that are disrupted or that are severed off can re reconstitute themselves doesn't indicate that the predecessor organism was not. Um, and then there's an interesting philosophical question as to whether or not the, you know, it, whether the one organism existed. Oh, that, that, two, that, we don't need to get into that. My that's, students will raise questions about right. how many organisms are there? Right. Did one organism die and two came to be or did one stay and there was a, a budding right. event and that's beyond the scope of this yeah. conversation. Yeah, no, right. And it's not, and that's again, a question that's not directly relevant to the abortion question. Um, so uh, some people uh, talk about, and again, we're talking about um, the process of, of development and various possible interventions. What do you make, what's the, uh, how should we think about embryos that are in cryopreservation? That is embryos that are frozen, not, not in terms of what we should do with them, that's a separate matter, but rather, uh, are, are they also living organisms when they're in that state of suspended a animation and it's dependent upon someone else to determine what their future will be? So there were organisms before they went into freezing. They are organisms when they come out of freezing. So there's no reason to think that they're not organisms while they're being, while they're frozen. However, ha you know, it's clear that when they are frozen at these very low temperatures, the biological functions are somehow put into stasis. We don't really understand that, but I think we can clearly say they remain organisms. But in a sense, they're in a they're organisms in a deep biological sleep. Um, the last question that I'm going to ask you is kind of a question that that trades on, and again, these are typical arguments that that trade on our intuitions and our reactions to things which is generally not a great uh got moral guide frequently if history serves how i respond to someone who looks different from me is frequently a very bad indicator of that person's intrinsic value right but there are frequently questions raised uh that, that trade in that kind of uh, an intuition and and one of the things that came up when we were again with the president's council on bioethics was well, okay, but if you're in a laboratory and you have a frozen embryo in a pipette in, in a freezer and you've got a one-year-old and the place catches on fire, everybody's going to save the one-year-old. So doesn't that really mean that we don't actually value the early stage of the human being in the same way that we, we value uh, postnatal human beings? Well, that's a very striking question because I've actually talked to women who are on IVF and they will say that if those embryos were their only remaining children, they would take those embryos over the one-year-old kid. Wow. So I think, you know, so I, so I think that this, those, those intuitions are not as stable as you would imagine. I think people would understand that if you could run into a burning kindergarten, it is normal and natural for you to pick out and save your child without in any way saying that the other children in the kindergarten who may die are of less moral status than, um, than, than your child. The reason why you do that is because to you, they are worth more. There, there's a subjective value that you place on your child that, that is different from the objective value that makes all of us equal. So, uh, you know, given that conversation I've had with women who have, ha who have frozen embryos and, you know, the, and especially if they know that those frozen embryos are the only ones they will ever have left, they will tell me that those embryos are human organisms that are more valuable to them than any other kid. And I, and I think that this is something for us to consider with regards to that intuition, right? Um, and it's interesting because they will ask me whether or not there's something wrong with that. And that's how I bring up the kindergarten, the burning kindergarten example for them to appreciate how to favor one is not necessarily to diminish the moral status of another. 
Right. I, I heard one person put it in the following way. The, the principle of women and children first doesn't mean that the remaining men on the boat that's sinking can be used for destructive, lethal research experimentation. Right. That we still value their lives, even though we have a, a sort of a, a priority ordering of mm -hmm. who we rescue and when. Um, so is there anything, Father Nick, you'd like to say before we conclude here? We're almost to the end of our time. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say uh, in, in closing or shall uh, we just proceed to the- to I, think, I think I'll end this way, you know, so I'm a molecular biologist, but I'm a priest first. And so what I've learned in the 15 years I've been working with Project Rachel, and I'd like to share this with your audience, whom I'm assuming most of whom are pro-lifers, is that when you're when you're work when you're dealing with abortion and when you're dealing with women activists who are pro-choice, so often the reason they are pro-choice is because they have been wounded by abortion, and so we have to be firm, but we also have to be gentle, and I think that's really important because sometimes in the cacophony of voices, in the yelling and screaming that often permeates our politics so tragically we forget that there are wounded people on both sides and that we are called especially if we are believers we are called in christ to be charitable with each other to realize that the other is not evil that the other is wounded that the other has made tragic grave moral immoral choices but that other is still loved by the father and is still a brother, a sister in Christ. That's very, that's, that's a beautiful way to end father. Thank you all, uh, everyone who's joined us this evening uh, to hear from our wonderful speaker, Father Nick Ostriaco, who's a great uh, biologist, theologian, and a very holy priest. Uh, this concludes our second session of the 2020 Vita Institute. Um, and you can see more uh, of Father Nick's work on his website, uh, ThomisticEvolution.org. Uh, thank you to all of our benefactors and friends who made this possible. A little later this week, we'll have some special messages of thanks for those in a more particular way, who, uh, those benefactors, friends, and staff members who are working hard to bring this series to you. Uh, but for now, we'll just we'll, we'll leave it uh, at that short thank you. Uh, and we look forward to having all of you join us tomorrow evening at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern for our next presentation. I actually will be speaking tomorrow night uh, on U.S. abortion law and policy to describe the, the legal landscape uh, connected to abortion that will draw uh, in part on the, the remarks of our speaker this evening as well as our speaker uh, yesterday. Until then, friends, take care of yourself and take care of each other.